I'm Nick Pettit. I'm Jason Seifer. And you're watching The Treehouse Show, your weekly dose of internets where we talk about all things web design, web development, and more. In this episode, we'll be talking about JavaScript web page performance metrics, carousels, MV-ish frameworks, and more. Let's check it out. First up, we have this really cool utility called Justice. Justice is an embeddable script for displaying web page performance metrics. Now, who, is, who made this? Is this Batman made this? Uh, no, it was, a, it was a bunch of people. I, I think a whole league oh, okay. of them. You know, like the Justice League? Yeah, I got, I got the joke. It was yeah. It's kind of playing on your. Yeah, we're taking it too far now. Joke about Batman. Really so uh, here is Justice. And if you look at the bottom of the screen right here, it shows you different metrics on the page. It shows you how long it takes to repaint the current FPS count. And it also shows you how easy this is to use and initialize. So just include the Justice JavaScript and call justice.init if only getting real justice were that easy. Hmm. Well, actually, we're kind of lucky it is not because our puns are so horrible. Hmm. Uh, so anyway, you can create budgets to stay within. And if you're over budget, it'll display different colors. This is very, very easy to use. And uh, not much to say about it, but if you are developing uh, any web pages where FPS is important, definitely check this out. And FPS, of course, stands for frames per second. And you want to try to stay above 60 frames per second on any website. So if you're like doing some cool like scrolling effect or animation, that can drop your frames per second. So using this tool, you can measure something like that. Uh, next up is this really cool blog post from Dan Cortes, Cort Cortez. Cortez. Co co uh, Dan C on how to make a carousel using only HTML and CSS, no JavaScript request. Required. Now, when I first saw that, I was like, "Well, how is that even possible?" Hey, look at that! It's a bunch of bunch of people on a field. That's right. Do so, you think when they were he was looking at this, he's like, "Oh, the ball's in your Cortez." That's his last name. I don't. I don't know if that's, if that's how you say it. Uh, but yeah, so this uses no JavaScript. You can click through, and it will go to the next image without any kind of JavaScript. That's not possible. And I thought, how in the world is Dan C doing this? Well, the HTML is actually pretty straightforward. I'll let you go to the blog post if you want to see how that is put together. However, it is in the CSS, or SCSS, in this particular case, where the magic happens. So there's quite a lot of stuff here that's really just positioning and transforms. And all of that is important to making this work. You have to have the buttons to actually click on, and you want them to be in the right place, and you want things to be transparent and all that. The way this is actually working is by using the target pseudo element. So you'll see right here that it says star target, and then it has a selector to grab the first item and it's setting the opacity to zero. And one really nice thing about this blog post is that everything is very well commented. There's these really large and detailed comments above each step, so you can see how it's put together. But by using that target pseudo class, it's actually reading from the URI what the user clicked on. So if they click on one of those arrows, it's going to grab the target plus each new item. And you just have to create a selector for each item you want to add. Really cool technique. Definitely be sure to check this one out. I have not seen something quite like this before, but it's a very smart use of the target pseudo class. Next up, we have a project called JS Blocks. This is a, quote, better MV ish framework. Now, uh, what's really nice uh, about this framework, it supports all the things that you would expect from a JavaScript framework. It's been a couple weeks since we talked about one. But this supports two-way data binding, and it has a nice built-in utility library for fast data manipulations. Also, it is really, really fast. But probably the most interesting thing about this framework is that it also supports server-side rendering. 
So what that means is if you are using Node.js, you can render the entire page before it gets sent down to the client. Now this means that your client is going to have a very quick initial load and things like SEO will work. Google can index your page rather than having to go through and click through all the JavaScript, which may or may not load uh, depending on the framework that you use. So uh, it's pretty easy to use. Like I said, it um, supports the two-way data binding, and it has a really interesting query syntax. Now, we're not going to go through all of this. Uh, I do recommend that you check it out in the show notes, uh, especially if you want to get into something like server-side rendering, which is really going to be a lot more important these days. Very cool stuff. Next up is a tool that helps you center things in CSS. It's appropriately titled how to center in CSS. So what is it? Well, centering in CSS is surprisingly difficult even in 2015, especially if you want to center things vertically. How do you do it? Well, here's why it's so complicated. There's a lot of different variables that you have to keep in mind, such as the alignment, whether or not the width and height is known or unknown, and there's also browser support that you have to consider. This tool breaks it all down into a step-by-step -step process so you can just check off each item and fill in some information and then it will give you the code that you need to center something. So here we have the content and it asks, well, what do you want to center? Is it just text or is it a div, any block level element? We'll go with text. It'll say, how many lines of text do you have? Uh, well, we do know that. Let's say uh, it's three. Do you know the line height of each line? Sure. We'll say we're going with 1M. And then the container. Well, how big is the container div? Do you know the width and height? Let's just say we don't, and we don't know what the width and height is going to be. Perhaps this is some user-generated content of some sort, and we're limiting the length of text, but we don't necessarily know how things are going to wrap around and so on. Then we have the alignment. So uh, we can actually choose between left, center, and right, and top, middle, and bottom for horizontal and vertical. It says, surprise, the site isn't just for centering. So we can align it however we want, but let's say we want it to be right in the middle of the page. We want it horizontal and vertically centered, and we'll say, eh, we want support for Internet Explorer 10. We can say generate code. And then it says the method for this particular code should be table cell. If we want to have that IE support and we want to do all of the things that we specified, here's the code that we're going to need. However, let's say that, well, I don't actually need IE support. Maybe I'm deploying this to I don't know, an internal network or something where the browsers are already pre-installed and we know what the browser is going to be, it's not IE. Then it says, well, okay, then you can use Flexbox and here is the code to do that. So this is a really great tool because centering things in CSS is notoriously difficult. It's really hard to get stuff particularly aligned vertically and horizontally, especially if you don't know the exact size of the elements. So definitely be sure to check this out if you ever get stuck trying to center something in CSS. Yeah, it's very cool. I especially like that surprise at the end. Hmm. Like, whoa, they went all out. Yeah, I didn't really expect that. Let's see that coming. Next up, we have an ECMAScript compatibility table. Now, this is going to be really useful if you are developing a JavaScript application and need to know whether or not certain platforms support the JavaScript that you are going to use. Now, they have a bunch of different versions of ECMAScript up here. ECMAScript is, of course, the specification for JavaScript. And as things make their way into the ECMAScript standard, you start to see them being supported in different browsers. So I have the ECMAScript 5 table up here. And you can see uh, over on the left, we have the feature name, like object.create, define property. And then over on the right are the different environments, and green means supported. So we can see IE9, 10, Firefox, and so on all support object.create, but the ES5 shim library does not. So they have a really, really nice compatibility table for ECMAScript 5, which actually has quite a bit of support. 
However, when we start going up inversions, well, we can see that things are not quite supported as much. Uh, what's really cool about this, though, is for the at least ECMAScript 6 standards, they have polyfills with support as well. So you can see if different syntax is going to be supported in whatever polyfill you're using. And then over on the right, it has the desktop browsers that you would expect. Um, IE 10, not a lot of support for this. And then even goes into servers and runtimes. So if you are going to be developing a modern JavaScript application and want to start using more modern JavaScript, definitely make sure to check this out. And we'll have a link to that in the show notes. Well, that is all we have time for this week. I am at NickRP on Twitter. And I am at Jay Cypher. For more information on anything we talked about, check out the show notes below this video. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.